For our lesson tonight, I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles, please. 1 Chronicles. We'll be reading out of 1 Chronicles chapter 21. This lesson is uh, actually part two, if you wish, of what we talked about this morning. This morning we talked about the theory, the theory, um, the boredom bear, how to avoid you know, becoming dry spiritually, some of the things that we need to do. <clears throat> Tonight we'll look at the practical aspect and uh, take a look at an example of someone who did that very thing. But first, before we get into the text, just want to mention the idea of the lesson tonight called Breaking the Sin Habit. Breaking the Sin Habit. Most of our sins are little ones. They're little ones. Our sins rarely get us on the 10 o'clock news. I mean, I hope so anyways. I mean, few of us, and, and I'm talking to us here in the congregation, few of us are ever convicted of you know, hopefully ro a robbery or murder or rape or something like that. Those are, the, those are the biggies. Those get on the news. I mean, the majority of Christians manage to avoid the big whopping sins most of the time. That's why when a Christian actually does break the law, it is news. It is news. Now our sins are the grinding, day-to-day -day little violations that repeat themselves over and over and over again, and they bore little holes into our souls that eventually bleed us of all faith and spiritual energy. It's like a slow death. Big sins are like dynamite. You know, they blow up the house in, in a tremendous bang. Little sins are like termites that slowly eat through everything and cause the house to collapse in on itself. Either way, the house is destroyed. Paul the Apostle puts it this way, the wages of sin is death, Romans 3, verse 23. Notice he never qualifies if it's a big sin or little sin. He never says the wage of the big sins is death. He just says the wage of sin is death. So the point I'm getting to here is that whether it's a big sin or a little one, we need to break the habit of sin if we are to grow in Christ, if we are to remain faithful to Him, if we are you know, able to go to heaven, and also if we are to you know, beat that boredom bear, this would be like the fourth point. You, know? you want to beat that boredom bear, try breaking the sin habit. Now Jesus demands that we repent of our sins in order to be forgiven. He says that, for example, in Luke 24, verse 47. And this means that a person must turn or change his mind and conduct with regards to sin. And here's the thing it doesn't say, but that it means. It means to, 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 to change our mind and change our conduct with regards to all sin. Not just the big ones, all of them. It doesn't just mean being sorry for sin. Repentance means breaking the habit of sin in one's life. The habit of big sins, the habit of little sins. You know, the cruelest lie that Satan will have us believe is that repentance means getting rid of the big stuff but not worrying about the little stuff. He knows that more houses are destroyed by termites than by dynamite. David in the Old Testament was a person who understood how important it was to break the sin habit in his life. He saw firsthand how sin uh, caused so many problems for him in his life. And so we get to chapter uh, 21 of 1 Chronicles and we read a story that teaches us how David broke the habit of sin in his own life. My point with this lesson is that perhaps his experience can help us break the sin cycle in our life as well. I believe the Bible tells us that these things are written for our instructions. So let's go to chapter 21, 1 Chronicles, beginning in verse one. Just read verse one. And it says, then 
Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. I'm going to stop there. Here's the temptation. David is tempted by Satan to conduct a census. Now you have to understand, taking a census was not a sin in itself since God had ordered this type of thing before. But this time, however, the prompting to do so came from Satan and probably appealed to the desire in David to increase his wealth through taxes or perhaps bolster his confidence based on the strength of his army rather than on the strength of God. There's where the temptation was. That's what the seduction was all about. So we keep reading verse two. It says, so David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring me word that I may know their number. And Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went through all Israel and came to Jerusalem. I want you to note here that Joab, who was the king's advisor and his military commander, recognizes immediately the wrong and he warns the king. He says, don't, I'm your advisor, don't do this thing. And the Bible records that David's command prevailed, meaning David prevailed. Now it doesn't say it there, but can't you imagine the dialogue going on? I hear you, but listen, we're going to do it my way. I'm in charge. Just go out and count the people. I don't want to hear about it anymore. And so we continue reading the story in verse five. It says, and Joab gave the number of the census of all the people to David. And all Israel were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah was 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not number Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. So Joab wouldn't bring himself to provide an accurate count, so he skips over two of the tribes. You'll get a count, but you won't get it exactly you know, right down to the last person. Now the writer here says that God was displeased and he punished Israel because of the sin of its king. And I want you to note that the people suffer because of the wrongs of their leader. Did the people do anything wrong? I mean, they're not the one that started the census. They were, they were just counted. You know, it should give us pause to think about who we vote for in elections and the fact that there are consequences based on the choices that we make as our leaders, just as there were consequences here through the mistake or the sin of the leader. Now in the balance of the chapter, we see David's response to God's judgment and how in this response he strives to break the sin habit that brought him to this point in his life. So the first step that he makes, that David makes to break this sin habit is realization. Look at verse eight. It says, and David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of thy servant for I have done very foolishly. Step number one in breaking that sin habit, realization. David acknowledges that what he has done is wrong. He realizes and acknowledges that what he has done is foolish. It is disobedient. Notice he doesn't say, oh, I just made a mistake. I, I, I love, well, I don't love it, but you know, I, I don't know what the word is, but I'm watching on TV and I'm seeing some famous politician or sports figure or celebrity or whatever got caught driving drunk as a skunk the wrong way down a street and ran somebody over and either kill them or injured them and ruined their career and so on and so forth. And then they go on and they have a press conference and the guy says, you know, I've made a mistake. That's not a mistake. A mistake is you turn down the street and you go left thinking you're on Henny, but you're really on Hiawassee. That's a mistake. Or you order a Big Mac instead of a salad. That's a, well, I don't know what that is, but anyways. 
But you know what I'm saying? That th those are not mistakes. Those are sins. Notice there are no excuses given by David. He didn't say, you know, there's a lot of pressure when you're the king, you know, and I, I must have caved under pressure. He didn't say, well, you know, uh, there are foreign armies and I, and I had to kind of build up the army and I had to know people in order to build up. He didn't say that. He didn't say, uh, you know what? Oh, the, this is the one I really love. Yeah. Well, nobody's perfect. He didn't say or give the argument that well, this is not such a big sin. Nobody got hurt. What's the big deal? In other words, he didn't try to minimize what he had done. If it is against God's will, it's a sin. If it is a sin, then God hates it, big or small. In Psalm 5 verse 4, uh, the, the writer says that God cannot tolerate the slightest sin. If God hates it, then we need to get rid of it. This first step is so difficult for so many Christians because they know that if they acknowledge that something is a sin, they're going to have to follow through and get rid of it. That's usually the, that's usually the cause for the resistance. If I don't quite own up totally to it, then I don't quite have to give it up either. If I can minimize it, then I can still practice it. If I can dismiss it, then I can act in a sinful way without having my conscience bother me. This is why there is such a, 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 a defense of little sins, little vices, like addiction to tobacco products, or immodest dress, or impure sexual activity, like watching a pornography or sexual activity between unmarried persons, little sins like gossip and laziness and stubbornness, dishonesty about little things like cheating on homework or copying computer programs and videos and getting into events for free in some way or another. Sins like revenge and petty cruelty and selfishness. You know, we have all kinds of excuses, all kinds of defense mechanism to protect our little sins from being dealt with. It's so amazing that people will believe the preacher if he talks about doctrine. You know, uh, uh, God created the world out of nothing and he quotes a scripture and people go, Amen, brother. And they'll believe the preacher when he talks about the, you know, the meaning of a Greek word or the plan of salvation, or marriage counseling methods, but they won't accept His word when He points out their little sins. Just like David ignoring Joab's warning, they refuse to accept what the pulpit warns against and ultimately will pay the price. When he was finally judged, David took the first and necessary step in breaking the sin habit. He realized that what he was doing was a sin and he had to deal with it as such. No excuses, no whining, no moaning. He manned up and acknowledged what he had done was wrong in the eyes of God. Step number two, breaking the sin. Remember, we're talking about breaking the sin habit. Step number two, repentance. You can't have repentance until you have realization. First comes realization, then comes repentance. Let's go to verse nine, continue the story. It says, and the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, go and speak to David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things, choose for yourself one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all territory of, um, of Israel. Now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So very simply, God offers three choices of punishment for his sin, three years of famine on the nation, three months of foreign armies attacking, three days of pestilence and disease in the land that the Lord will send. 
And David chooses the three days of disease sent by God on the nation. And I think he chooses this because he would rather suffer the consequences in the hands of God than in the hands of the weather or certainly his enemies. So by this choice, he shows that he is prepared to trust God regardless of the circumstances. I mean, think about the three choices now. He could prepare for a famine like Joseph prepared. Uh-oh, there's a famine coming. Let's save up some food you know, and so on and so forth. He could you know, fight an enemy with his army. Let's get the army out to all the important strategic places because there's going to be an army coming against us. But he didn't do that. He chose to put his life completely in the hands of God. Very interesting. His sin, remember now, his sin wasn't about counting people. His sin was not trusting God by counting the people. That was his sin. The repentance was not just suffering the consequences. The repentance was change. And the change that was needed in David is he had to go back to trusting God. That was true repentance. Breaking the sin habit requires change. Not excusing the sin, getting rid of the sin. Not loving the sin, hating the sin. Not being afraid that we can't live without the sin, but trusting that God will fill the hole where the sin used to be with something better. And I'm telling you something. This third point here, is probably the strongest reason why people do not abandon all their sins. They're afraid that God will not give them what the sin is giving them, whatever that is. Whatever it's pleasure or comfort or excitement, whatever it is, they're afraid if I give this thing up, then there'll be an emptiness there that no one can fill. That's why the idea of this lesson here is that the sin that, that David did was that he didn't trust God. And the repentance that was required was not not counting the people. The repentance required was that going back and trusting God for a change. That was the sin. That was the repentance. We never will break our sin habit unless we're ready to allow God to ask us to change any part, any habit that we have and replace it with something better, something cleaner, something godlier. You think for a second, really now, you think for a second that if you give up a certain sin that God can't have something better for you than that sin? If you take drugs, He can't give you something better than drugs? If you're a liar and you begin telling the truth that telling the truth will not bring better things into your life than lying and so on and so forth? Think about that for a second. You want to break the sin habit, repent. And then the third step is restitution. Verses 14 to 17 says the following. I'll get it in a second. Here we go. So he says, so the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. 70,000 men of Israel fell and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity and said to the destroying angel, it is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Onan, uh, the, uh, excuse me, uh, of Ornan, the Jebusite. Then David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven with his drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders covered with sackcloth fell on their faces, and David said to God, Is it not I? who commanded to count the people. Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? O Lord my God, please let thy hand be against me and my father's household, but not against thy people, that they should be plagued. And so David's repentance opened his eyes to the true nature and extent of his sins. And that was the destruction of lives. Think about it. If the king that God has placed over the people stops trusting in God, what do you think is going to happen to the people? They're going to stop trusting in God. And then not only is the king going to be destroyed, the people will be destroyed as well. That was the seriousness, the level of seriousness 
of David's sin. This realization moved him to the next important step in breaking the sin habit, and that was the desire to do something about it, the need to make restitution of some kind. He didn't want his sin to hurt other people, so he offered himself as a sacrifice to stop the punishment, to appease God in some way. That's human thinking, to appease now this is an important step in breaking the sin habit for several reasons. One, it is a demonstration that a person truly understands the seriousness and evil of their sin. They want to fix it. Sinners who actively fight against their former sins or try to make up for them prove their sincerity. And secondly, it shows where a person stands in regard to that sin. There's an example, you know, I mentioned uh, people consume pornography and there was a, a woman, her name was Linda Lovelace, and she made pornographic, that wasn't her real name, but that was her stage name, and she made pornographic movies and actually became quite famous at it. But then she quit and she got married and she had a family and she rejected that lifestyle. But even more than that, she became a very outspoken, uh, opponent to pornography about its evil and destructive nature and she raised money and awareness and she wrote a book and she went to Washington to, uh, to be a witness at, at some committee about the dangers of that type of thing. You knew where this woman stood. Her life changed and she wanted to make a difference against the thing that she had previously supported. And then thirdly, this restitution prepares us for the last and most necessary step in breaking the sin habit. You know, some people get to the point of restitution and they never go any further. They become advocates, they build hospitals, they write books. But David went one important step further which guaranteed his freedom from the sin habit. And you know what that was? Restoration. Restoration between himself and God. Verse 18 he says, Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad which he spoke in the name of the Lord. And then I want you to go down to verse 26 real quick. It says, Then David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he called to the Lord and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put his sword back in its sheath. I want you to notice that when David was wanting to offer himself, when he realized that his sin was worth his life, only at that point did God restore him back to fellowship with himself once again. You know, the idea of building an altar and offering sacrifice demonstrated that David and God were at peace with one another once again. That's the significance of that action. God allowed David to offer an animal instead of himself as a peace offering to bring about reconciliation. You know, until a person truly understands that it is sin, big sin and little sin, that cause our separation from God and our ultimate destruction, they don't feel the need to be reconciled to God. You want to have a Bible study with someone, they say, well, what's your first objective when you're teaching somebody the gospel? What do you think it is? It's to convince that person that they're a sinner. Because if they're not convinced they're a sinner, pff, who needs Jesus? I don't need Jesus. I don't have a need for Him. They remain ignorant or they go on sinning thinking that God will not require an accounting for every sin in their lives. But when we see the destruction of sin like David did, when we begin to desire to make things right with God, then we like David want to offer a sacrifice. And that peace offering to take away the sin, to remove the guilt and fear that stands between us and God. There's actually a desire to do that. A lot of young Christians are like that. They, they're trying to make up for the wrong things that they did. And that's when a wonderful thing happens in the spirit. That's when God sends Jesus Christ to rescue us. Because it won't be our understanding or repentance of sin that will restore us. 
And it won't be our active efforts to combat sin and its effect that will remove our guilt. And it won't be our own personal sacrifice or death that will take away our condemnation. We cannot make restitution or pay our moral debt ourselves, no matter how many hospitals we make, no matter how many good deeds we do. It will be the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that will pay the moral debt we owe for our sins, that will cleanse our consciences of guilt, that will remove our fear of punishment, that will make us be at peace with God forever, and that will guarantee our place in heaven. But we're not ready to see it, we're not ready to understand it in our inner man until we try to make a true repentance, until we see the truth about ourselves. David offered an animal with the hope that one day God would send a perfect sacrifice that would remove sin for everyone and break the sin habit in us once and for all. So this was the turning point, by the way, if you're studying David's life. This, this, this story here, this episode, was the turning point in his life because after this event, he turned his attention to preparing the resources and preparing his son to build a magnificent temple for the Lord. If he went from the need to build his own kingdom to the desire to build God's kingdom. And that's what happens in our own lives when we break the sin habit. We begin by realizing what our sins really are. We accept what others tell us or we respond to our conscience or we realize that the trouble that we're in is the result of our own sinfulness. And then we move to sincere repentance that includes a willingness and an effort at real change and a change regardless of the cost in pain and inconvenience or the degree of self-denial that might be required. And then repentance leads us to a desire to make things right, to do the right thing, to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And then God satisfies that thirst for righteousness because it'll draw us to the only one who can satisfy that spiritual thirst the one who gives the living water, and that's Jesus Christ. Our desire to be right with God will open our eyes and open our heart to the need to believe in Jesus and be baptized in His name to wash away sins and to be at peace with God once and for all. What a tremendous blessing to lay your head down on the pillow at night and regardless of what's taken place that day to be able to say, I am at peace with you, dear Lord. You can come and take me tonight, and I am at peace. Glory and hallelujah to His name because of that great gift. And so I ask you, what kind of sinner are you? Are you a big time sinner, a little sinner? Well, I'll tell you, we're all sinners, but what kind are you? Are you the kind struggling daily against it? Is that your type of sin? Or do you have a, a sin habit that needs to be broken? What kind of people does God look for? The tall ones that stick their chests out? Can't tell me what to do. Is He looking for those people? Or is He looking for the broken ones? I think He's looking for the broken ones. Now is the time to break free. Now is the time to stop the cycle. If you need help to break your sin habit, if you want to repent, if you want to be right with God through baptism, then we encourage you to come tonight. Let this be the night that you begin the cycle of breaking sin in your life. The angels will rejoice and the church will be strengthened by your decision. If you have any needs of any kind for ministry, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.